I'm going to go ahead and start up. Are there any questions left over from last time? We mainly deal with the civil rights movement and different arguments related to that, just to show the difference between the natural right way of, of thinking and the utilitarian way of thinking. Okay, well, today I wanted to look at another branch of liberalism, and hopefully by the end of the day we'll, uh, we'll know the connection to Lockean liberalism a little bit better, have a little bit better idea of what libertarians are all about. Um, well, the most famous libertarian today probably is Ron Paul, who I had up just a moment ago. Um, and uh, I do have a video clip of him today from when he was quite a bit younger, so we can see what he was like then. And I think Rand Paul is maybe not quite as super libertarian as his dad, but they're pretty close. But you know, there you can see the libertarian influence there. Um, so they have Lockean roots, and what I mean by that is they do take up the same way of thinking about human nature, for instance, that Locke does. Remember, Locke says that in nature, people are capable of cooperation, right? That they can kind of handle their own business. And they're, unlike Hobbes, he doesn't say, you know, they're automatically going to be completely at war with each other, okay? Um, they, they are not depicted by Locke as completely non-social or anti-social beings. Um, they do, through the use of their reason, know how to treat each other, so they know that it's better, for instance, if they don't start conflict. It's better if they leave each other's property alone. They understand these as, he calls this natural law. And they're not only capable of knowing how they should act, but to a large extent, they can act that way. And so Locke, therefore, reasons the state of nature is not so bad. People would prefer it to tyranny. And as you know, he comes up with this right to revolution as a result. If you have tyranny, you revert to the state of nature if necessary, because it's preferable. But you also know that Locke said, for the most part, government is preferable, because we, we don't have the, the so-called inconveniences of the state of nature, right? which include having to be a judge in our own case, which may lead to you know, conflict that wouldn't otherwise exist if it was refereed by a government, because we're not impartial when it comes to the damages that are done to us. We're likely to maybe go a little bit too far in seeking justice. Um, but also because past a certain point, you, you need government to protect your property as it expands uh, from the accidental or on purpose predation of other people, okay? So Locke says, usually government is vastly superior to the state of nature. It allows people to continue to expand their property, and as you know, he thinks this is, this is essential for people's well-being. They will continue to get better off the more the people can do business, make money and grow the economy and so on and so forth, okay? Now, the difference with, between Locke and Locke's reasoning about the goodness of government, generally, and libertarians is that libertarians, you might say, are much more suspicious of this social contract, okay? Um, now, part of that is hindsight, you know, because libertarian gained a lot of traction, libertarianism gained traction after governments had become quite powerful, okay? Um, and so you can see that, uh, unlike the Lockean vision of limited government, where you know you, you make a social contract and you assign the government certain tasks and they're kind of minimal, like defense and you know police and roads and bridges and maybe a postal system or something like that. What's happened, of course, is over time as economies have have expanded, um, so has government. Okay. And it's gotten far bigger, I suppose, than Locke would have ever been able to imagine, or maybe even the founders of this country would have been able to imagine. And so libertarians look on that and they say, you know, maybe the social contract in and of itself is a problem. In other words, maybe government is a problem, or is always will always turn into a problem, okay? And that it is far more difficult for people to limit its scope than we thought it was. Okay, 
So for them, I would say it's almost inevitable. No, not almost. It is inevitable that government will abuse its power. Okay. So some libertarians actually go to the extreme of saying, therefore, it would be better if we had no government. Okay. We would be better off, and we'd still be able to cooperate. We'd still be able to get things done, and we'd actually be able to cooperate and get things done better if we didn't have government. Now, libertarian anarchism is that school of thought, and this term anarchy just means there's no overarching power, right? It doesn't mean a free-for-all, okay? Because libertarians don't think that if you leave people to their own devices that they will turn into a mob uh, uh, and, and start to attack each other but rather there will be a sort of natural order that will develop as people cooperate with each other, okay? So we'll hear one of the libertarians today say, you know, the, the first tenet of libertarianism is basically pacifism. It's, you know, not being aggressive to other people, okay? And of course, critis, critics of libertarians will say, well, that's where they go wrong because you know, we, we see all this evidence that people will be violent if, if you leave them alone, if you don't have strict law and, and law enforcement. Libertarians say violence is caused by government, by all the rules, regulations, constraints, um, you know, impositions upon people, all the distortions of the economy which create poverty, um, you know, all the criminalization of things that that don't need to be criminalized and so on and so forth. So they put it back on government. And they say, you know, truly we believe if people were left alone to figure things out and to cooperate with each other, the end result would be less crime, less violence, okay? All right, so we'll have to try to get a handle on exactly why. Uh, but your textbook rightly says anarchism, no government, is the logical culmination of liberal individualism. Liberalism taken to its absolute extreme is anarchism. No government at all. We're better off without it, okay? And real life libertarians tend to not go quite that far, but try to scale government back. The less government, the better, in every area. And one of the things they're famous for is being, so they say, consistent with with all of this, you know, so they don't say less government here, but more government there. They say less government across the board, okay? All right, so we have, you read today Murray Rothbard, um, who's a famous academic libertarian. So he's sort of a philosophic uh, type. Um, very, you know, he's written so many books. He's sort of one of the intellectual lights of the libertarian movement. And he starts off with a similar origin story to Locke with this idea that we uh, have properties in our own bodies that we, are, we should be completely free to do what we want to do with our own body. Okay? And that includes what we you know, mix from, with our labor, with things from the earth, ought to be ours. So he agrees with Locke there. Okay? Whether it's acorns or a horse or or a piece of land, whatever it is, um, it should be ours then, okay? And nobody should be able to take it away from us. Okay? We can trade it willfully to another for something else. We can give it away if we want to, but it needs to be voluntary, okay? Any involuntary taking is theft. And so we'll see him say basically that taxation is theft. Take a look at that, okay? So he sticks with Locke there, but in evaluating the state that emerges from Lockean theory, like I said, he disagrees that we are actually the authors of our government. This is what he says. He says the, li the uh, liberal mythology is the way he would look at it. The liberal mythology says that you are a member of a social contract, that you give consent to the social contract and you give consent to being in either the majority or the minority, depending upon the issue at hand. But even if you're in the minority, 
you still have given consent because you've consented to the system for the sake of peace and good order and everybody benefits including you from it okay but did you actually give consent to many of the things that you have to deal with from government on a daily basis did you cons did you consent to the over 9% sales tax when you buy your food when did you ever consent to it did you consent to being uh, in the selective service list for the guys. Yeah. It just appears in your mail one day, doesn't it? Yes. And they don't even like have you go down and sign up anymore. It, it just, it's there, okay? So <clears throat> there are many things all day long, I mean, if you think about it, the government has us do or not do that we never can remember a time when we actually gave affirmative consent. Okay. Locke knew this. He just simply said, "You give your." He called it tacit consent. People give their tacit consent by not directly opposing, by not either leaving the country or rebelling in some way. They give their tacit consent, and they should understand that if they stay there and benefit from the system by, you know, benefiting from the law that's provided and the police force and, the, and all of this stuff that they are, in effect, consenting to the system. Okay. He, was, he was more interested in making sure people understood where the line was drawn, where the system became oppressive. Now, Rothbard obviously thinks it becomes oppressive almost immediately, whereas Locke thought it took a long time, a lot of, uh, we call it a long train of abuses, right? That, that, in his language that Jefferson picked up on from Locke. A long train of abuses have to take place. Well, Rothbard, not so long. Uh, so I wanted to show you this. It's about 10 minutes long, this video. That's a Rothbard speaking. He's narrating a book that he wrote. It kind of sums up his philosophy pretty well. <laughs> In the phrase, we are the government, the useful collective term, we, has enabled an ideological camouflage to be thrown over the naked, exploitative reality of political life. For if we truly are the government, then anything a government does to an individual is not only just and not tyrannical, it is also voluntary on the part of the individual concerned. If the government has incurred a huge public debt, which must be paid by taxing one group on behalf of another, this reality of burden is conveniently obscured by blithely saying that we owe it to ourselves. But who are the we, and who the ourselves? If the government drags a man or even throws him into jail for dissident opinions, then he is only doing it to himself, and therefore nothing improper has occurred. Under this reasoning, then, Jews murdered by the Nazi government were not murdered. They must have committed suicide, since they were the government, which was democratically chosen, and therefore anything the government did to them was only voluntary on their part. But there is no way out of such grotesqueries for those supporters of government who see the state merely as a benevolent and voluntary agent of the public. And so we must conclude that we are not the government. The government is not us. The government does not in any accurate sense represent the majority of the people. But even if it did, even if 90% of the people decided to murder or enslave the other 10%, this would still be murder and slavery and would not be voluntary suicide or enslavement on the part of the oppressed minority. Crime is crime. Aggression against rights is aggression, no matter how many citizens agree to the oppression. There is nothing sacrosanct about the majority. The lynch mob, too, is the majority in its own domain. But while, as in the lynch mob, the majority can become actively tyrannical and aggressive, the normal and continuing condition of the state is oligarchic rule. 
ruled by a coercive elite which has managed to gain control of the state machinery. There are two basic reasons for this. One is the inequality and division of labor inherent in the nature of man, which gives rise to an iron law of oligarchy in all of man's activities. And second is the parasitic nature of the state enterprise itself. We have said that the individualist is not an egalitarian. Part of the reason for this is the individualist's insight into the vast diversity and individuality within mankind, a diversity that has the chance to flower and expand as civilization and living standards progress. Individuals differ in ability and in interest, both within and between occupations. And hence, in all occupations and walks of life, whether it be steel production or the organization of a bridge club, leadership in the activity will inevitably be assumed by a relative handful of the most able and energetic, while the remaining majority will form themselves into rank and file followers. This truth applies to all activities, whether they are beneficial or malevolent, as in criminal organizations. Indeed, the discovery of the iron law of oligarchy was made by the Italian sociologist Robert Michels, who found that the Social Democratic Party of Germany, despite its rhetorical commitment to egalitarianism, was rigidly oligarchical and hierarchical in its actual functioning. A second basic reason for the oligarchic rule of the state is its parasitic nature, the fact that it lives coercively off the production of the citizenry. To be successful to its practitioners, the fruits of parasitic exploitation must be confined to a relative minority, otherwise a meaningless plunder of all by all would result in no gains for anyone. Nowhere has the coercive and parasitic nature of the state been more clearly limned than by the great late 19th century German sociologist Franz Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer pointed out that there are two and only two mutually exclusive means for man to obtain wealth. One, the method of production and voluntary exchange, the method of the free market, Oppenheimer termed the economic means. The other, the method of robbery by the use of violence, he called the political means. The political means is clearly parasitic, for it requires previous production for the exploiters to confiscate, and it subtracts from instead of adding to the total production in society. Oppenheimer then proceeded to define the state as the organization of the political means, the systematization of the predatory process over a given territorial area. In short, private crime is at best sporadic and uncertain. The parasitism is ephemeral, and the coercive parasitic lifeline can be cut at any time by the resistance of the victims. The state provides a legal, orderly, systematic channel for predation on the property of the producers. It makes certain, secure, and relatively peaceful the lifeline of the parasitic caste in society. The great libertarian writer Albert J. Nock wrote vividly that the state claims and exercises the monopoly of crime. It forbids private murder, but itself organizes murder on a colossal scale. It punishes private theft, but itself lays unscrupulous hands on anything at once, whether the property of citizen or of alien. At first, of course, it is startling for someone to consider taxation as robbery, and therefore government as a band of robbers. But anyone who persists in thinking of taxation as in some sense a voluntary payment can see what happens if he chooses not to pay. The great economist Joseph Schumpeter, himself by no means a libertarian, wrote that the state has been living on a revenue which was being produced in the private sphere for private purposes and had to be deflected from these purposes by political force. The theory which construes taxes on the analogy of club dues or of the purchase of the services of, say, a doctor, only proves how far removed this part of the social sciences is from scientific habits of mind. The eminent Viennese legal positivist Hans Kelsen attempted in his treatise The General Theory of Law and the State 
to establish a political theory and justification of the state on a strictly scientific and value-free basis. What happened is that early in the book, he came to the crucial sticking point, the pons asinorum of political philosophy. What distinguishes the edicts of the state from the commands of a banded gang? Kelson's answer was simply to say that the decrees of the state are valid and to proceed happily from there without bothering to define or explain this concept of validity. Indeed, it would be a useful exercise for non-libertarians to ponder this question. How can you define taxation in a way which makes it different from robbery? To the great 19th century individualist anarchist and constitutional lawyer Lysander Spooner, there was no problem in finding the answer. Spooner's analysis of the state as robber group is perhaps the most devastating ever written. It is true that the theory of our Constitution is that all taxes are paid voluntarily, that our government is a mutual insurance company, voluntarily entered into by the people with each other. But this theory of our government is wholly different from the practical fact. The fact is that the government, like a highwayman, says to a man, your money or your life. And many, if not most, taxes are paid under the compulsion of that threat. The government does not, indeed, waylay a man in a lonely place, spring upon him from the roadside, and, holding a pistol to his head, proceed to rifle his pockets. But the robbery is nonetheless a robbery on that account, and it is far more dastardly and shameful. The highwayman takes solely upon himself the responsibility, danger, and crime of his own act. He does not pretend that he has any rightful claim to your money, or that he intends to use it for your own benefit. He does not pretend to be anything but a robber. He has not acquired impudence enough to profess to be merely a protector, and that he takes men's money against their will merely to enable him to protect those infatuated travelers who feel perfectly able to protect themselves, or do not appreciate his peculiar system of protection. He is too sensible a man to make such professions as these. Furthermore, having taken your money, he leaves you as you wish him to do. He does not persist in following you on the road against your will, assuming to be your rightful sovereign on account of the protection he affords you. He does not keep protecting you by commanding you to bow down and serve him, by requiring you to do this and forbidding you to do that, by robbing you of more money as often as he finds it for his interest or pleasure to do so, and by branding you as a rebel, a traitor, and an enemy to your country, and shooting you down without mercy if you dispute his authority or resist his demands. He is too much of a gentleman to be guilty of such impostures and insults and villainies as these. In short, he does not, in addition to robbing you, attempt to make you either his dupe or his slave. Government as a sort of protection racket is what's being put forward there. There's got to be some questions here. Does anybody want to? Yeah. I have a lot of issues with what you just on some level said there. Mm -hmm. When we started with the idea, when we talked about the Holocaust and how the government is not us, that doesn't mean that, like, that just sounds absurd to me. I mean, mm -hmm. when you say that the, you know, when he's making the claim, he's trying to show that the, you know, the absurdity that the government is not us. Well, of course it's not them, but that doesn't mean that the government is not um, in any way valid or that it's always used against you and that it can never do any services for you. That just means that the government, in that sense, as a tool, is turned against the people that it should help. Uh huh. Yeah. So, so. I mean, that seems like, that seems crazy. Well, Murray Rothbard goes, he really does go to the extreme, and he says things like that all the time. And yeah, the, um, 
it, it's all, as a general rule, it's best to not make appeals through any sort of appeal to the Holocaust, which is in and of itself, I mean, because it just invites all sorts of questions um, and problems. To be able to equate that with anything else is problematic, but yeah. And I guess the other thing is, if he, you know, obviously he believes in a free market and things like that, a capitalist market where people do what's in their best interest for economic survival and whatnot, but if you're going to do that, how can he not also see that he calls, you know, the theory of political means of economic gain, but yet how can he not say that if people are just going to do what's in their best interest in this anarchical, libertarian world, why wouldn't you just steal from somebody? It's much, much easier if I just wait for somebody to leave their laptops in there, if I just wait for you to leave your documents there, read sure. them, sell them. That's far easier than work. That's far easier than political means. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think that that's a very common objection to libertarianism, and I think that there's a lot of evidence that, that you're right. And I think one thing that makes them interestingly, there's not much, believe me, that makes them similar to Marxists, but in this one way, at least, is that they think that we, the way that we think and, and behave has been so warped by our, the influence of our government and our way of life that this is why we would, at this point in time, or at least some of us, would you know, look at this type of thing as an opportunity to take advantage. They seem to be saying that human nature, stripped of all of this warping that has taken place, would be capable of that kind of more peaceful cooperation. Yeah. Um, one thing that I have seen in the past on a lot of libertarians is that they believe in the non-aggression principle, which is you don't do anything, you don't say anything that could seriously hurt another individual, like theft. And in the state of nature, if everybody agrees to this non-aggression principle, then everybody get, you're not going to you know you're not going to have theft happen to you. People aren't going to murder you. You know that kind of thing is not going to happen because if somebody does go and do that, then everybody else has a right to no longer interact with that individual. You won't be able to do business. You right. won't be able to you know survive basically because we are social creatures and we do need other people for help. To break that principle would then ostracize you from the entirety of the community. So natural law is what you're really referring to there because and how that operates is if you do something wrong, there will be consequences, right? People will not do business with you, as you say, won't want to be around you, may actually also take some sort of retributive action, at least in the case of some libertarians would allow for that. You know, in other words, you know, some rudimentary self-enforcing I'll get back to you, but yeah. It just sounds like he's trying to sell us on a different type of utopia. Mm -hmm. um, but it comes with a big flaw that he assumes everyone is going to think like him in this utopia. Everyone is going to have that libertarian mindset. You know, whereas yeah. we've seen in communism, not not everybody thinks the same. Mm -hmm. So you are going to have inequality in communism and. I see the same thing here. You're going to have inequality in this proposed utopia of his. That iron law of oligarchy that, that the libertarian says happens when we put these organizations in place might still happen even in the state of nature and people would be on. So one always it, wants to be first. And there's no way to, to disprove either of the two assertions, actually, since we can't do this experiment, right? Yeah. Um, I guess the first question would be, so basically, you know, the Marxist paradigm is that eventually, you know, you can change human nature to be where the prime desire of life will be work because it will be enjoyable. And I see that he's going for a similar sort of paradigm, like a similar sort of paradigm shift here. Is that kind of what you're trying to convey there? Right, right. Um, if we are left to our own devices, truly, we will establish our own order and we will establish ideas that work better. In other words, for instance, and libertarians are famous for saying drug use fine, you know, prostitution fine, any sort of so-called victimless crime, we shouldn't criminalize it. They're not pro-prostitution drug use. They, they tend to think that if people are allowed to do what they want to do, what you'll find is people will learn and, and they will regulate themselves and become self-regulating. Mm -hmm. And I guess the other thing that I have a question on is how do you connect the idea, the state of nature, 
with a non-aggression principle, because you can view society now with a pretty robust set of laws, economically, socially, and mm -hmm. people, things like that. Well, you know, these laws, there are people who commit heinous acts that are completely within our own laws now. Right, right, right. So I don't see how you could, you know, and like there's certain, and these are certainly acts that you would call heinous. Right. Um, I don't see how removing these laws would then suddenly, yes, you might be a social outcast, but there are a lot of people who commit completely legal heinous acts and never pay for it. Well, okay, this is the libertarian answer, okay? Think, um, if you will, I mean, you guys didn't live back then, and neither did I, but my, my parents were kids in the 30s, okay? And they came from small towns, okay? And in the case of my, my dad came from Kentucky, occasionally people would get out on the street and have a shootout, okay? For the most part, people did get along. Part of it was genuine shared values. Another part was they were kind of afraid of each other a little bit. You know, they didn't want to feel the consequences of of being, you know, going against other people or violating their rights. And so, and, and there was no, you know, law enforcement to be found. Um, so of course, life was simpler. Um, and the, the libertarian looks at this type of situation that prevailed in a lot of places in the country and in the world where there is no government but people actually kind of live peaceably together anyway. Locke said, you know, we have, we know how to behave and for the most part we do. Um, and the second part of their answer would be, we have so much of these heinous crimes and mental problems, et cetera, et cetera, because of the influence of government. They blame government for this, for creating the environment in a lot of different ways. For instance, our school system and our health care system, not to, and the military and all of this stuff, and even our economy and the way that it's regulated by the government. Um, for instance, I mean, um, uh, you know, the government pays uh, subsidies to people to grow corn. Corn is, everywhere. It's in everything that you eat. So it's in your gasoline. Why? Not because it's economically viable for it to be there, but because government wants it to be there. It's kind of like a huge, this is the libertarian perspective, but it's, it's a huge social welfare program. It makes your food cheaper. It helps out supposedly farmers, but they don't feel like it. Mainly it helps out consumers, but it's making people unhealthy and fat. And then we have to pay more for the, the health care system. Okay, to make up for that. Okay, so then the list goes on and on and on. So they, they point to things like that and say, you know what, maybe we would be able to handle life better and actually create our own rules of conduct and maybe we would be more peaceable if government didn't interfere all the time. But, you know, I get the objections because it's very hard to know if that's right. You know, that we don't have the ability to to truly find out. That's about the closest I can come to, you know, if you look back in history, you can see certain places and times where people live pretty much government free and not too badly, but in a much more primitive way, because as Locke points out, for you to have advanced, you know, economy, and I mean, advanced capitalism in particular, which Locke couldn't have conceived of, of now, you have to have governments, it would seem, right? So now another point I wanted to make was the libertarian, libertarians generally, but particularly the libertarian anarchists, are try to be very consistent, and they have both leftist and right wing uh, values. You might say you can see in there, and there's something that ties them together. So on the very first page of your reading, you have Rothbard saying the libertarian stands four square for what are generally known as civil liberties, freedom to speak, publish, assemble to engage in such victimless crimes as pornography, sexual deviation, and prostitution. And yes, people argue endlessly about whether any of those things and drug use are victimless crimes. Furthermore, he regards conscription as slavery on a massive scale. Libertarian regards such conflicts as mass murder and therefore totally illegitimate. Those, he says, kind of are ideas that's, that lead to the left. Um, although I don't think that conservatives would probably agree that freedom of speech, print, and assembly are left-wing values. 
And then in the second paragraph there, he says, or third, he says, all of these positions are now considered leftist. On the other hand, since the libertarian also opposes invasion of rights of private property, this also means that he just as emphatically opposes government interference with property rights or with free market economy through controls, regulations, subsidies, and so on. They are champions of laissez-faire capitalism. Okay. So they, what makes them consistent? They don't want government involved in anything. And as I said, they aren't saying that pornography is good or that uh, you know, prostitution is good or that drug use is good, but rather that government's interference in these things hasn't made things better. Okay, that we have, in fact, maybe more prostitution because of, you know, prostitution occurs because of drug use. Well, we've criminalized drug use, which means, you know, it's not out in the open, it's behind the scenes. Um, and it just, you know, they show how government, government's regulation, government's law and law enforcement actually produces a certain amount, in fact, a large amount of crime, prostitution, illegal drug use under the table and so on and so forth. So, um, yes, it sounds kind of utopian. What really sounds utopian is if you thought this was a good idea, how the heck would you get there at this point, right? It's just as big of a problem as if you thought being a, a communist was a good idea, how would you get there at this point? Uh, so what it turns into is not anarchism, which is rarely extolled in you know, public debate, but rather a milder form of libertarianism where, where they argue for you know, greatly reducing the power and the scope of government, okay? So, a couple of examples. I've already given this one, basically. Um, but, you know, just another example of how government can kind of interfere with people's choices. Um, we bail people out if they get flooded. You know, we have FEMA, we have, uh, and we go in all uh, with Hurricane Katrina, and yeah, it's very imperfect and terrible. I'm not saying they did a good job, but people went back and lived there. The libertarian would say, there are some places where if government wasn't involved, people simply wouldn't live and then there would be no people being killed by these disasters. There wouldn't be um, people being left destitute because FEMA doesn't show up or it gives them a terrible you know, living situation um, and creates more and more problems for them. Okay? Um, I used to live near the Mississippi River and um, people would just live, you know, live right by the river with the full knowing that they would be they would be flooded out occasionally and their property would be ruined. And either if they had flood insurance or the government would come in eventually and fix things and they'd be back. Yeah. But you're at risk of a natural disaster pretty much everywhere. Like what would they say to that? Like even here we're as far away from the ocean as you can really be in the yeah. United States. We're not near any major body of water, and yet you can do bold as a tornado at any Very time. True. Spring. Very true. Not as inevitable. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess I guess if they were to answer that would be that there's some places that are just obviously unlivable. You know that 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 you know for sure this is going to happen at some point. Um, yeah. The only reason people would, could not live next to rivers now is because the government provides services like water. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was no government. Everybody would live by the Good point. Good point. And, if, and maybe if they did, then they'd figure out a way to handle the flooding issues better, too. So, but yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Did I see a hand up over here? He's still on my video. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But libertarians are great because you can always, I mean, they love to argue. And <laughs> there's always an argument to be had. Um, let's see. I think I have time least for this one. This is good too, it's shorter, but it's Ron Paul, and, and this is from when he was younger. So you get to see him very... Well, what about the Libertarian Party? Can you tell us a little bit about what it stands for? The Libertarian Party is based on a 
firm principle of non-aggression. We all take a pledge when we join the party that we will never initiate force against somebody else. And that is a, you know, a pretty simple principle that everybody should endorse. It's a principle of what makes civilization. That is, you respect other people's life, and you respect other people's property. Thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not murder. It's, a, it's that simple, and most everybody agrees to that. And the next question on me is, well, why, why should you be different than Republican and Democrats if they tend to agree with that same principle? Well, we, we believe it's such an important moral principle that if we can't take somebody else's property, we can't hurt anybody, or we can't intimidate anybody, or threaten to use force, we don't think the government can either. But we see the government as the initiator of force to bring about social and economic changes day in and day out. I mean, they, they may not come up to our front door with a gun, and occasionally they do, but we know if we don't deliver our money and our records and do obediently what the government wants in order to give up our portion of our income through the Internal Revenue Service, the gun will be quickly at our door and we will be in prison. So it's the threat, the intimidation, and therefore they're transferring wealth, something that we can't do as individuals. So we as libertarians reject this whole idea of forcible redistributional wealth, which is the welfare state. Same way in personal liberties. We apply this principle in the area of personal liberties, and although I might want you and think you should leave a certain, lead a certain lifestyle, because I think it's good and right and moral, I have no right to tell you what to do. You know, if, if you want to live a certain way, I disagree. That's, that's tough. You know, that's your, your choosing. That's the individual's choice, as long as you don't hurt somebody else. So the person has the right to his own life and his liberty, his own lifestyle, as with one special rule that your lifestyle, the individual's lifestyle, can't hurt somebody else. So if you do things that I disapprove of, I, as a libertarian, am tolerant and I accept that up until the point of no injury to anybody else. And see no now, I principle there. talk to uh, libertarians or listen to them review them on TV, and they're talking about government power all the time and abuse of governmental power. But I also see some libertarians, not a whole lot of them, a lot of them also talk about corporate power as well. In other words, they're talking about power in general. There seem to be two types of libertarian. Well, um, I don't, I don't find, I, I think we have one type of libertarian because we all accept the same principle. I think it's more easily found that you have several types of Republicans and several types of Democrats because they're interventionists and they can intervene any way they want. But uh, I think libertarians are pretty consistent in certainly condemning the power of government. Uh, I haven't heard a libertarian saying that we need more government or they're not a libertarian. But on the corporate power, I think where the confusion might come is corporate size, if it's gained by serving the consumer, is not necessarily evil. So if, uh, if you have 90% uh, of the car industry, and for some miraculous reason, for some unknown reason, there's no imports. If you have 90% of it, that doesn't bother me as a libertarian if you have the best car at the best price and the consumers are very happy. Now, if you own, if you have 90% or 100% of a utility company and you're gouging the customers and the customers have no place else to go, we detest the corporate side. We detest corporate power when it's gained through government power, you know, government coercion, if it's a contract. Uh, the military industrial complex is a pretty good example of how large industries benefit by big government. Of course, in big banking, big banks benefit by this monetary system because they're sort of in collusion with the Federal Reserve System, so we detest that. We detest bigness, and we detest corporate power when it's gained through privilege from government. If corporations are large, and, and there's always free entry in a free market, if they're large because they serve the consumer, we don't worry too much about that because we know the consumer is benefiting. If they get to the point that they have 100% of an industry, which is not possible in a free market, let's say, just for instance, if they have 100%, and then they start to gouge the people, there would immediately be competition. The people. Okay, and there's one more thing I was hoping to show you, but. This, this is a libertarian on coalition building. Ron Paul actually is, um, you know, I mean, he's been a politician. He's accepted the system and worked within it for while, quite a while. So he's an example of somebody who can speak rather extremely but is capable of 
dealing with the fact that the world isn't the way he wants it to be. Yeah. Isn't it kind of ironic that a voter's hand is running for president would be running for president because they don't think they like government? It is. It's very, very popular. It seems ironic. That's what I mean by, you know, and he has run for president. Um, and is he still in the race? Well, he dropped out. He dropped, he dropped out, out, okay, out. this time yeah. again. Yeah. Well, he's, I mean, it's impossible. This year too. Okay. It's impossible for them to win. You know, they go into it thinking we'll, you know, kind of uh, get our word out that way. I think is what. It is. But but it is ironic that he's been, he's been a part of the political system forever, yeah. right? Um, and on the other hand, you know, I'm sure he looks at it as I'm trying to have my influence any way I can, and that makes him a little bit different than uh, Murray Rothbard, who's just completely kind of in the ideas man. This is a uh, columnist and radio talk show host, um, Walter Williams, who's a pretty famous libertarian too. And I've got, I'll just show a little bit of him. He's now almost 80 years old, but um, also the author of a lot of books. And, and he's talking about exactly this issue of can libertarians work with non-libertarians? Libertarian response Two over Williams these years. Many. <laughs> many libertarians see a world of no political trade offs. That is, either one is 100% libertarian or not at all. It's all or nothing world of purity tests in many cases. Now, that might be somewhat of an exaggeration, but it's close. In any case, I'm here to tell you that those who take the all or nothing position of the world usually wind up with nothing. Now, many Americans agree with many libertarian principles. However, we've not been smart enough to exploit these areas of agreement. In other words, just because some group does not buy into our position on the decriminalization of drugs, that does not mean that we cannot forge an alliance with them on some other liberty-oriented task. In other words, what I'm saying, at least in the short run, we have to face the fact that in order, to, in order to have some political victories, we have to at least make an effort towards appealing to the median voter. And hopefully try to educate voters while we're in office, as opposed to trying to educate them outside of office. Libertarians are going to have to recognize that the average person does not spend the kind of time that we do reading Locke, Mill, Hume, von Humboldt, Jefferson, Hayek, and others, and thinking about liberty. Our response to those who appear to cherish liberty less than we do will have to be more educative rather than put off -ish. You know. So, and I think that that's a, that's a strategy that they really take seriously. Williams, by the way, points out something straight from Locke that's worth pondering. Slavery would not be possible without government. Slavery only exists in as much as you have a strong government that actually can enforce it. So, they have their points. All right. <laughs>